I want to talk today about um, the molecular mechanisms of disease. Now, that sounds awful probably, but it's not so bad. I'm just going to go molecular mechanisms. So a mechanism is just how something works. If you take your hands and you clasp them and you, you try to pull your hands apart, the mechanism of why your hands don't come apart is because you just made two clasps. So all a mechanism is is how something works. Molecular, well, well I'm a biochemist and I study atomic and molecular things. And really, as all bio, almost all biochemists do, I study proteins. A protein is a, is a nanomachine. It's a molecular machine inside your cell that does something. It can do anything you want it to do. This is an example, a really well-known example of uh, kinesin. It is a protein that transports things along a protein highway from one side of the cell to your, another side of the cell. So again, a nanomachine. All a protein is a nanomachine. Uh, and you can get a sense of size here. You see the, the texture of this thing? Um, that is, those are individual atoms. So we really are talking about atomic scale resolution of things that are going on inside your cell every day. Now the proteins I work on uh, are part of this network of proteins called the cytoskeleton. So what you see in this picture here is a cell. The blue part is the DNA. There's some like reddish stuff around it that's just sort of the outside of the cell. And in the middle is this green stuff. This is the cytoskeleton. The cytoskeleton gives structure to what would otherwise just be a big bag of goo. Uh, and you need this if you think about like your neurons. You need to have your neuron go from your brain to your big toe in order to tell you when you stubbed your toe. And you need your neurons to, or you need uh, a cytoskeleton, to, you need your cells to have a structure in order for, say, your gut cells to have a brush border in order to better um, get nutrients from the gut into your, uh, into your blood. And you might need a cytoskeleton for your muscles. Your muscles have to um, be sort of long and skinny and they have to contract and expand and contract and expand, which actually is a big problem for the cytoskeleton because what I just said is they both have to have a structure, but they also have to be flexible. There has to be a lot of motion involved. Um, so when you think about the cytoskeleton, how I think about it, is sort of like a wicker basket. This, you see here, you see this, this green stuff that's extensively cross-linked. There, there, it's a weave pattern almost. It looks sort of like a wicker basket, and it acts like a wicker basket. A wicker basket is both strong, but if you take a wicker basket, you can squish it. And that's, that's, what, that's what we study. Um, now, the exact protein I study is, is called Titan. One of the proteins I study is called Titan. And Titan's the red bit here. Uh, if you take your muscle cell and divide it and divide it and divide it and divide it, divide it over and over and over again, at some point you're going to get to the smallest part of the muscle cell that can still act like a muscle cell. It can expand and contract. That's what this is. So these are individual proteins in your muscle cell. Uh, this unit repeats millions and millions and millions of times, and that's what makes up your muscle cells. And what prevents, you see how this thing is contracting and expanding. What prevents this thing from overexpanding is that red bit. That red bit is Titan and it acts like a molecular spring. As it gets stretched, it makes it so that this whole apparatus can't get stretched even further. Uh, this is actually really important. This is the reason that your muscles don't overextend all the time. If your muscles overextend, your muscles are probably going to break open. Uh, and if your muscles break open, you're going to have um, muscle wasting disease. And one of the muscle wasting diseases that's probably most commonly known is stuff like muscular dystrophy. And in fact, if you mess up that red part up there, you get muscular dystrophy. So it's worth looking at the spring a little more closely, this molecular spring. This, this nano machine inside your cells. So this is a spring. And if you see a spring do its thing, it needs two things to do its thing. It needs to have the springy bit in the middle to actually be a spring. And it has to be connected. It has to be glued to, to two things, to two sides. So when you look at this thing expanding and contracting, yeah, you can see the spring part, but you also see where the, um, the red part is sort of connected to everything else. Now, it turns out that that's the part that we study. And the reason we study this is we really want to see the glue that's holding the spring to everything else. And we actually can look at this an atomic um, resolution. And we can do this like a couple hundred feet that way in the, the physics and chemistry building here. Um, and when we, looked at, when we look at this, we see, well, okay, this is the glue holding the spring together. The, the orange part is the spring, and the green part, is, or the orange part is part of the spring, and the green part is everything else, and where the orange and green meet, that's the glue. Uh, and what you see, what people noticed when they saw this glue, is they said, well, there's four mutations in Titan. 
And each of those four mutations, the spring, and each of those four mutations is linked to muscular dystrophy. So obviously what's happening is, well, the mutations are making it so the glue doesn't work, which makes it so the spring doesn't work, which makes it so the cells lie, which makes it so you have mus uh, muscular dystrophy. And that seemed like an open and shut case. Uh, a couple years ago, we started studying this. Said it does seem like an open and shut case. But let, let's just look, just just to make sure. And so, um, an undergraduate student made all these mutations, and we looked at it uh, with a couple techniques. It's, they're biochemistry techniques, so they, the names are awful. There's uh, the thermal titration calorimetry, which basically measures if the glue works, and heteronuclear multidimensional nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, which <laughs> just rolls off the tongue. But that allows us to see the, the atomic detail, where every atom is in this whole thing. So these, this is what we're doing. And um, there are four mutations all associated with muscular dystrophy. The first mutation we tested worked just like we thought. The mutation messes up the glue. Just, just that's, that's what we thought was going to happen. The second mutation, well, it also messed up the glue. It made, made, made the glue not, not gluey. Uh, but only at body temperature inside us. If we did it on the bench top at room temperature, ambient temperature, um, the glue worked just fine. Well, that's actually two different molecular mechanisms of action. One is just glue doesn't work. And the other is glue doesn't work, but there's a temperature dependence. Okay. One of the mutations, the, the blue one up there, uh, not only makes the glue not work, but also causes the spring to stick to the other springs. And this is actually a really bad thing for your cells. It's called aggregation. And um, people who have these mutations uh, tend to be uh, really sick. They tend to be sicker than other, other people. And, and one, of the one of the mutations we studied, the black one up there, I, I55, um, didn't do anything at all. It looked, the, the glue is just fine. And the, um, the, 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 how the glue, how all these atoms were arranged, how the glue works, was just fine. And it was so much like normal that I told my, my poor student, um, you did it wrong. You clearly, you know, in biochemistry, we just have clear liquids, and that's, that's it. And so you, you picked up the wrong clear liquid. You tested the wrong thing. Do it again. And he did it again and got the same result. And through maybe six or nine months of just doing controls and doing it again and again and again, finally, after all that time, I believed him. I said, okay, this thing does not cause disease. Okay, so what I just told you is that four mutations on the same little bit of a spring, on this random, relatively weird, obscure protein nobody's heard about, cause muscular dystrophy, but they have four different molecular mechanisms of action. Well, so that means that if we wanted to fix or cure muscular dystrophy, we would have to have four different strategies for doing that, just for one disease. So four different uh, mutations cause one disease, but we'd have to have four different ways of dealing with that one disease. And this is true with muscular dystrophy. It's true other, uh, in, in other cells as well. So this brings me, when I start thinking about this in bigger context, to a quote from Anna Karenina, which you may or may not have had to read in high school, um, which is, it starts off, I at least read the first line, which is, happy families are all alike. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. Well, with what I just told you, normal cells are all the same. They're normal. But every abnormal cell, every cell that has a mutation in it, is going to have that mutation is going to be unique, likely, and it's going to have a unique something wrong with it. So this is, again, muscular dystrophy, this is true. This is also true for things like cancer. So take uh, the most common uh, protein that's mutated in cancer. This is called P53. If you have it, you're good. If you have a mutation in it, you're not so good. You will get cancer. This is the big one. Um, and when you look at the population and where the mutations occur, you see hot spots. Right? So if you have a mutation in, say, R175 up there, we know how that causes cancer. We know what it does to the, to the nanomachine, to the molecular mechanism of this protein. And we, in theory, can come up with a workaround. And we can come up with some fancy pants way of, uh, of curing this kind of cancer. But what if you have a mutation that's in the weeds down there? that like nobody else has, like something around like, I don't know, one where the yellow and the green meet or something like that. Well, that's actually a real problem because that means we don't know what those mutations do. People certainly have them, but not that many people. So this is actually the big problem with things like the, big, the next big thing in medicine is personalized medicine. You may have heard about personalized medicine on the radio or elsewhere. Um, 
personalized medicine, what you do, it's really easy. My, my wife's a doctor and she says she does this sometimes. You take a, a Q-tip, swab the inside of your, of your mouth, and send it off along with a couple hundred dollars to some company and they'll tell you every single mutation you have in your genome and that's supposed to help save you. If you have a mutation like R175, that probably will help save you because you'll get the results back and you'll say, R175, I'm P53, that causes cancer, we know how to fix that. But what happens and what mostly happens is you have all these other mutations. You have a mutation at 106. Well, it's NP53, so it's likely to cause cancer, but we don't know the molecular mechanism of it, and we don't have any way of fixing it. All of a sudden, this personalized medicine, all it did was um, give you data with nothing, and we can't do anything with it. It's like dead data, data that's out there that the only thing it's going to do is to worry you. So this is both the problem and the good thing about, about this personalized medicine uh, craze that, is, that, that doctors are talking about. Well, people really selling stuff to doctors are talking about these days. And this brings me to just another general slide about this. When you start reading about these personalized medicine um, articles and you start saying, well, is this really a good idea? Do we actually know enough? If, well, you would think you do. If you, if, so I, I look at Reddit pretty frequently and every week on Reddit there is something that says scientists cured and pick your favorite disease. It's scientists cured blah blah blah. And yet whatever your favorite disease is, is still around. And they've been saying this, scientists cure whatever, for years now. Why are these diseases still around? Do the scientists lie? No. What probably happened was a scientist figured out the molecular mechanism of their disease, and they figured out a workaround and a strategy to deal with this disease. Um, and then the reporter, of course, is trying to, to sell things and, you know, uh, th they, um, they dumb it down even further. So the take home of that is that almost everything is probably more complex than you've been led to believe. We still don't understand it. And what this whole talk is basically about is how very important it is to continue to do this kind of research. And important for you guys, since you're taxpayers and you pay for it, the ability for you to continue to fund this kind of research. And I think that's a pretty good place for me to stop. Thank you.